Hi, I'm attorney Gregory Dell, joined by attorney Stephen Jessup. And we're going to talk about one of Stephen's resolved cases against the principal life insurance company. And Stephen, in these cases, we like to talk about the background of the case, how you were able to overcome the claim denial, and give some tips for people who may have a principal financial claim or principal life insurance claim that will help them in the future with their long-term disability matter. So what's the background of this particular claim? Yeah, and to start, this is kind of a cautionary tale because we got involved once all the appeals were denied, so it was only for a lawsuit. Um, so the background of the claim is a client was a, a, program, a software programmer um, who was suffering from a condition known as non-24. Uh, which is a circadian rhythm, uh, you know, disruption condition that the first time I ever heard of it was seeing a commercial for a medication for it to help treat it. And usually it occurs almost exclusively in people who are legally blind, who are blind, have no vision whatsoever. And what ends up happening is because of that, they're in the lack of sensitivity to light, their circadian rhythms get messed up, they can't sleep, things like that. Um, but is my, it, what, what type of disorder is it considered though? Is it a, is it a, is it a um, eye disorder? Is it a central nervous system disorder? It's more considered a sleep disorder. Okay. A sleep disorder because of the way it affects the body's ability to understand circadian rhythms for sleep. So, you know, my client, you know, in, in his situation, his sleep schedule was crazy. Couldn't sleep. Sometimes he would only sleep an hour over a couple of days. It was really bad. Um, so he had filed a claim for, for disability. Uh, principal, you know, reviewed it, uh, denied it, uh, saying, listen, we just don't think there's enough evidence to support, A, you having this condition, and then because of that, we, we think you can do your job. Uh, he did do the appeal on his own. Um, you know, at the time, his medical information, it was not really built up. He wasn't in with a specialist yet and things like that. So he submitted the appeal probably prematurely, probably should have waited till he had gotten into specialists and stuff like that. Um, principal, again, did a review of everything, had several doctors look at it and just said, we don't think the diagnosis is confirmed. You know, your doctor says it is, we don't think you meet it, you know, and we think there's nothing that prevents you from doing your occupational duties as a software programmer. Um, and then they denied his claim. And then at that point, his only option was, you know, the filing of a lawsuit. So he was never approved at all? Never approved. And when you said you thought the appeal was done prematurely, what type of additional evidence do you think you would have wanted to have? I think more on the specialist side of things, right? Um, you know, what the specialist uh, had to say about the fact that here's a person who's not blind, who can see fine, is suffering from this condition, which traditionally only strikes people who are blind. Um, information on it, whether it be journals, any type of articles you could find information-wise to support, you know, yes, him having this and how it's impacting and things like that. Um, that's where you really would have wanted to see. I think part of the concern was is obviously, you know, being sick, not being able to work, having no income coming in, um, and then also, um, you know, the lack of sleep and just anyone who hasn't slept well knows how they can get, you know, angry, emotional, you know, just fried up. I think he wanted to try to rush to get the money, you know, wanted to get it off his, his, his plate, if you will. And that it ended up hurting him in the long now, run. What type of treating doctors did he have? He was treating with, uh, first went to eye doctors, right? And treating with neurologists and then a sleep specialist. Okay. So um, in this particular claim, you didn't have the opportunity to do an appeal. Mm -hmm. However, it sounds like there would have been many things that you would have done differently that could have possibly had him win the claim at the appeal level and not have to reach litigation. Was this a claim governed by ERISA and what does that mean? Yes, yeah, so this was an ERISA uh, policy. Principal does both individual and ERISA. So something he got through his employer, which means it was going to fall under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, for purposes of litigation, meaning federal court jurisdiction, um, no state law claims whatsoever, no jury trials, no live testimony from him, his doctors, anyone from principal, and as of that date of final denial, no new information allowed to come for a judge to consider. Even though after the final denial, information did start coming in that was at least more supportive, um, but it was something that a, a court wouldn't be allowed to, to look at. So when you got retained, you were essentially married to all of the information that was already presented. And no matter what your ideas were in terms of how you could improve the evidence that could potentially help his claim, 
the law would not allow you to show that evidence once a lawsuit was filed. Correct. So my, my hands were very much tied. And, and from the get-go, I explained a lot of this to him, what, what the difficulties are going to be. Uh, it's not that, you know, I, like, I believed him, but it's a matter of a lot of what we do is we can believe the client. You know, we ha have trust and faith in what they're reporting, but can we prove it by a certain legal standard? And here the legal standard was going to be, did they act, you know, was he disabled? And the judge may have said, listen, I don't see enough medical information here to even say you're disabled under the policy, and that could be the end of it. But even if the judge had found you know, medical disability, then it becomes a question of, you know, did principal act arbitrary and capricious? You know, it didn't have a reasonable basis to deny the claim. From my review of it, seeing what they did in the review process, I would say it's reasonable. They even offered to send him to an independent medical evaluation, and he declined that which I thought could also have been a problem because then he's refusing. And they said, all right, well, if you don't feel that that's in your best interest, we'll have your file reviewed by, you know, and at that point, two doctors. So they were being reasonable in the review. They were trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. So it was a very uphill battle. Um, and then one of the other things, and I think this is probably the biggest, well, not the biggest cautionary tale. The biggest cautionary tale is don't rush the, the appeal. appeal you're right. uh, and then the second one is for anyone who has a principal claim is his policy defined what a mental health condition was very interestingly. Um, very broad and open. It, and first criteria is, you know, any mental health condition regardless of ideology, be it organic, chemical, biological, any of this stuff, right? Um, and that's found in the diagnostic uh, criteria for mental health, right, or the, the recent one, DSM-5. And what a lot of people don't know, and I didn't know this, but when I saw everything, I, I went in to see the DSM-5, non-24 is in the DSM-5. So although principal wasn't arguing that it could be, a, it was subject to a 24-month limitation, they didn't get that far, they just said you're not disabled, um, because of it being in the DSM-5, just like insomnia and some other sleep disorders, there would have been a very clear road for them to say, even if we approve you, we only have to pay you for 24 months. So there was, there was a lot of moving pieces and parts that claims maybe didn't look at it, but I know from a standpoint of the, the lawsuit, their defense attorney was certainly going to you know, dig into that quite a bit. And so once you get hired, you filed a lawsuit in federal court, and your strategy was going to be that hopefully you could get a judge to determine that um, there was possibly some evidence that principal didn't consider um, or the way in which they reviewed some of the material wasn't reasonable and that they should have accepted the claim and therefore pay benefits. Um, <clears throat> So what was the timing and, and basically what was the, how did the claim end up resolving itself? Uh, it did end up resolving by a confidential, you know, settlement. So the case is resolved. Um, you know, just like in a lot of federal court cases, they do, once you file a lawsuit, you know, an answer is filed by the defense. Um, you set up scheduling orders and the courts want mediation. So where parties will come together at some point to try to reach a resolution to it. Um, so there's, at litigation standpoint, it's a lot of paperwork for the attorneys because, you know, principal's not going to ask anything of the client, um, request, uh, you know, updated medical information, surveil them, talk to them even, anything like that. So during the process of this and working with, you know, principals, you know, outside counsel hired, uh, a resolution was met. And, and in this area of the law, especially in a situation where we haven't had the ability to do the appeal, so when we get the information, we're married to what's there already. Um, your hands can be very tied, um, and in situations like that, you know, the vast majority of the time, the claim is going to reach some type of, you know, mutual, you know, resolution. Right, and, and I know what was the benefit of having you on the claim in our law firm was that when you did get that final claim file, because there's another claim file after the appeal claim file, that you were able to make some valid arguments that obviously brought some concerns to um, principle, which there's risk on both sides. Here, this was a claim that we felt even up front leans more in favor of principle. It wasn't one of the more egregious type claims that we typically see from other companies. And to principle's um, credit, they tend to be more reasonable than most of the other companies. And they did, a, they did a, a very good review, comparatively speaking. But, you know, and what was good in litigation from more than 20 plus years of us litigating and handling non-litigation claims with them, that there was a an attitude from them that, look, we'll reasonably look at the file, we'll consider your positions, and we'll evaluate our risk, just like every insurance company does. And, and fortunately here, this claimant 
knowing what was going on still came to you and you were still able to turn it into some kind of settlement that was obviously agreeable to principal and to the claimant. And, th and that's the idea at the end of the day is to um, get an outcome that the client is satisfied with. That's our goal. We're representing the client and to not necessarily see a client who says, I'm going to go away because this client couldn't go back to work. Yeah. The client just wasn't, didn't have the knowledge, the skill, the resources to present his or her claim in a manner that was appropriate enough to prove to meet the burden. Unfortunately, his back was against the wall because of the ERISA regulations, which completely are horrific. Because if this was a jury trial, and people don't understand this with ERISA, had you had the opportunity to go to a jury, bring in the doctors, all the other people that we talked about and present what was going on, completely different case. But that's not the way the law is created. That's why the premiums for this were probably $30 a month versus $200 a month for the benefit that he was getting. And you get what you pay for, unfortunately, in this scenario. And the ERISA laws are not always fair, but you can still salvage a claim and get some kind of outcome that could be positive for a claimant. So if you're someone who has a principal life insurance, long-term disability matter, feel free to reach out to Stephen or myself. No matter where you live in the country, we're available to assist you. We would very much like to provide you with an immediate free phone consultation to discuss your claim, and we look forward to answering your questions in the future. Hi, I'm Gregory Dell, the managing attorney of Dell Disability Lawyers, and I hope you find the video you just watched helpful. We put these videos out all of the time, and we'd love if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Beyond our videos on our YouTube channel, we also have lots of information available on our website at diattorney.com and we encourage you to come to our website. The goal is, is that we want you to be educated about the disability insurance process and when you get to our website you'll see that we have information all about your specific disability insurance company, your occupation, and your medical condition. And we've designed our website such that you can easily search our website to find things that you may specifically be looking for. Now at our website, we have thousands and thousands of pages of information, hundreds of videos that you can search, plus we're building a section of reviews of all the disability insurance companies, and we have the Ask Our Lawyer section where you can go ahead and ask us any questions that you may have. Now we realize that you may not need us right now, but you may need us in the future to help you with your disability claim and we think one of the best ways to keep in touch is by clicking the button below and subscribing to our channel and most importantly again no matter where you live in the country we're always available just go ahead and give us a call we're happy to discuss your claim and let you know immediately if we can help you